Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. This morning I'll be reading from the book of Philippians. It's a, a little bitty letter in the back of the New Testament. And I'll be reading Philippians chapter 3 starting at verse 4 and reading through verse 14. And this is what it says. Even though I too have reason for confidence in the flesh, if anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I've come to regard as lost because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as lost because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and regard them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death, if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own. Because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own. But this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. Pray with me. Jesus, this day we need strength. Strength enough to press on. And here during worship, may it not be about words and ideas, but may it be about you, the Word, and Spirit, your Spirit, that you join in our spirits and we press on. Amen. In a book by Charles Allen, he tells a story about two men who bumped into each other on a busy city sidewalk. They were old friends, hadn't seen each other in a long time, and they began to catch up a little bit and move their conversation over into a coffee shop. And then one of the fellows looked down at his watch and said, oh, I've missed my bus. The other one looked down at his watch and said, I've missed my train. Well, they discovered in the talking that they, their offices were close to each other. And so they said, well, I tell you what, why don't we meet here tomorrow for lunch and we can head home now? Well, the next day at lunch, they got back together and one of the fellows asked the other one, said, um, how'd your wife handle you being so late last night? The fellow said, oh, all I could do was apologize. I told her that I had run into you and we were reminiscing, going back over old times and that I'd lost track of time. And uh, all I could do was apologize and, and tell her I was sorry and she forgave me. How about your wife? He said, well, my wife got historical. He said, you mean hysterical? said, no, I mean historical. She brought up things that happened 20 years ago. 
<laughs> well, I don't know if you know anybody who has a tendency to get historical, but it's all our tendencies. We all have a tendency to reach back into the past and bring it into the future and try and forge our way forward by, by carrying along with us the past. That's what Paul is dealing with here. Well, people aren't bringing necessarily the, the, the hard, difficult things. What, what's going on is Paul's in prison right now. And the church that he loved dearly there in Philippi, well, there were some folks rising up in that church, bringing their past and, and telling folks, showing them their trophy case, showing them uh, their accomplishments, reading to folks their resume, saying that all that they had done in the past was, was a power play to make them powerful in the church. And Paul says, anybody wants to, to point to the trophy case, I have more reason than anybody. And then he reads a part of his resume right here. He says, you know, I, as far as, as, as being Jewish, I can trace my ancestors all the way back before Moses, the tribe of Benjamin. Only one of two tribes to have supported King David. And he says, as far as the, the section of that tribe, Pharisee. Pharisees didn't just follow the Ten Commandments and, and hope for the best. No, they followed all 613 of the commandments. And as Paul says, as far as that goes, I was blameless. In other words, I didn't just score a 90, 100 every time. Blameless. Anybody wants to point to their trophy case. Anybody wants to point to their resume. Anybody wants to point to their accomplishments. Paul says, I have more reason than anybody does. You want to get historical, I have reason to get historical. But he says, I count it all as rubbish. Some of your Bibles may say, I count it all as refuse or garbage. The reason that the Bible has a, a little bit of trouble translating that word is because Paul uses a really coarse word right there. Sewage is what he calls it. He says, the best things that I did compared to knowing Christ are nothing but sewage. So I press on. I press on and go forward. Not looking to my trophy case, not looking to the, to the, to the resume, not looking to the accomplishments, not getting historical. I press on. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. Pressing on, pressing on. And the first thing that I want to talk about this morning, pressing on in personal faith. What Paul says in verse 8, he says, Because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. That's what faith is, knowing Christ Jesus our Lord. And then again in verse 10, he says, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. That no matter what's in the trophy case, no matter what our accomplishments, no matter what the resume is, it doesn't mean a thing without a personal faith. Knowing Christ Jesus as the one that leads us here in this life. And knowing the power, the power of his resurrection in our lives. James Moore tells a story about being invited to give an invocation at a rodeo. He said he was waiting backstage when he overheard a couple of cowboys talking to each other. They were getting ready for the, for the, the bull riding competition, and, and they were going over the injuries. He said they, they looked like two pretty tough guys. That, uh, they were going over the number of times they had had broken ribs and sprained ankles and broken bones and that the, the bull had stepped on them. And then he said about that time, there was a fellow walked past, looked like, he was, he was just out of a cowboy catalog that his boots were brand new, his Levi's were freshly pressed, his rodeo shirt was, was gorgeous, and he, he wore a big cowboy hat. But he didn't look like he'd ever been on a horse in his life. The two cowboys stopped their conversation, nodded to the fellow, and when he walked by, one of them turned to the other and said, all hat and no cattle. <laughs> That's a familiar saying to many folks, but another saying might be familiar as all icing and no cake, or all sizzle and no steak. And it's, and it's all fluff and no substance. That there's, there's, there's no meat, there's no core, there's no cake, there's, no, there's nothing that, that really matters there. And that's what Paul's talking about is what really matters. 
doesn't the trophy case and the accomplishments that's not what matters it's that relationship with Jesus Christ it's a relationship that's known in the power of joy and peace the power of his resurrection joy and peace so here it is it's Paul Paul the fellow who's in in prison trying to build up trying to encourage trying to lift up those who are free that's a joy and a peace that that doesn't depend on our circumstances that's a joy and a peace that doesn't depend on the best of things falling to them that doesn't depend on the trophy case the resume or the accomplishments it's a joy and peace that comes from a relationship with Jesus Christ And Paul is saying, that's where you press on. That's the direction that you go. Press on. Press on in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. But not only that, he says, press on. Press on and remember who you are. Verse 12, this is what he says. Paul says, I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. He's borrowing language from the Old Testament, Deuteronomy, Isaiah, the Psalms. He has made us his own possession, that we belong to Jesus. We are his own possession. That's our identity. Remember who you are. Remember who you are in Christ. We live in a culture nowadays that wants to tell us what our identity is. That our identity is all about sometimes our trophy case, sometimes our accomplishments, sometimes our identity is about our, 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 our resume. But sometimes it's about our political party. Our identity is all about our, our age, or our race, or our gender, or our national origin. And there's this, this urge to, for, in this world to tell us, this is who you are, this is who you are, and this is all you can be. Jesus has more for you and for me than that. A while back, I was awakened late one night with a phone call. It was a phone call from my credit card company. Turns out there was a suspicious purchase going on right at that time in Bulgaria. <laughs> it was at a lingerie store in Bulgaria, and my, my credit card company was calling me to see if I was making a large purchase at a lingerie store in Bulgaria. I assured them that, no, that I was in my bed asleep in Georgia. You know, it's unnerving. It's unnerving to have your identity taken from you. Even if it's just your identity on a credit card. It's unnerving, and I didn't sleep for the rest of the night. Well, not only is it unnerving to have our identity taken from us on a credit card, it's unnerving to have our identity taken from us here on this earth. God has made you and me more than a trophy case, than a resume, than an accomplishment than all those identities that, the, that this world tries to push on us. The Apostle Paul in Galatians 2.20 says, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and delivered himself up for me. The way he puts it here, we are Christ's own possession, that we belong to him, that we're his very own possession. Pastor Don Tuttle tells a story about a play that he read about a fellow named Sam. In this play, Sam bumps into Jesus on a sidewalk. And Jesus tells him to, invites him to to deny himself and and take up his cross and follow him. Well, Sam's very reluctant. But he receives the invitation. And he agrees to to take up, to deny himself, take up his cross, and to follow him. But Jesus doesn't, in the play, doesn't give Sam a, a, a pocket-sized cross that he can hide in his pocket whenever he wants to. He doesn't even give him a gold cross that he can hide under his shirt. Jesus gives Sam a full-sized cross. And in the play, Sam carries the cross to work with him. 
Well, after a while, his boss tells him that the, the cross really isn't good for business at all. That by carrying his cross with him, Sam is no longer able to cut corners and he's no longer able to take advantage of customers. And well, the cross makes it difficult for Sam at work. He carries the cross with him on a date. And his date really is embarrassed by the cross. That can't he just be like everyone else? Later on in the play, he, he carries the cross with him among his friends. And it used to be fun among his friends was listed as making fun of others and demeaning other people. But now... That's not so much fun anymore for Sam. That all those things that were lost are now the very thing which brings Sam life. It's the cross. It's the risen Christ living in us. That the life we now live in the flesh, we live by that relationship with Christ who makes his life his home, and lives in us and through us. Press on. Press on and remember who you are. You're Christ's own possession. The last thing that I want to talk about this morning, press on. Press on and forget. In verse 13, Paul says, But this one thing I do, forget what lies behind and strain forward to what lies ahead. Who knew that forgetting was a part of the Christian life? But here Paul says that's, that's a part of what it is to, to follow Christ. Well, so far I've only pointed out the things in, in Paul's trophy case, in his resume, the very best things that Paul has done. That he was a, a, a Jew who could trace his, his, his heritage all the way back before Moses, that of his sect, he was a Pharisee. And of that sect of Pharisees, that he was blameless. He was the best of all. But one of the things that Paul includes in this resume, in this trophy case, is one thing that's not so good at all. He says, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church. Paul didn't just persecute the church with harsh language. He didn't just talk bad about all oh, those hypocritical Christians when he was away from it. Persecuted the church. Paul persecuted the church with imprisonment. He persecuted the church with beatings. Paul persecuted the church by, by tending the cloaks of those who were putting Stephen to death. He was an accessory to murder. Instead of being foremost in his, his trophy case, this had to be something that was foremost in his shame, something that fo followed him or maybe preceded him everywhere he went before he got there. But that's not who he is anymore. That's not who he is. This world would have us believe that we're nothing more than our our greatest defeat, than our greatest sorrow, and would have us rehearse it again and again and again. I read a story about Robert E. Lee that after the Civil War, he went around to a war-torn South, people that were nursing bitterness and, and hatred toward the Union. And he tells a story about a woman who had lost her husband in the war. She was a widow left alone to, to, to work on her farm. And as she worked on the farm, she pointed to a group of, of trees and she told Lee, she said, see that group of trees? Those trees have been here since before the Revolutionary War. The Union soldiers came down here. They, they, they gave their target practice to those trees. They shot them full of holes, and not only that, they carved their names in them. What do you think I should do about it? And Lee turned to her and said, you ought to cut them down and forget about it. That very often, very often, in that trophy case, in that resume, in that 
list of past, past accomplishments, we have something we've tucked away. It's a past shame that we rehearse. Maybe it's a betrayal that we go over, that we practice. Maybe it's a hurt. Maybe it's a pain that we repeat again and again and again, saying that we're nothing more than our last defeat. Jesus has more for you and for me than that. He says, press on, press on, that, that the life that he lives in you and me might be a life that we live in our identity as Christ's own, that we belong to him, that we forget what lies behind. This morning, it may be that you've been practicing that last failure, that you've been rehearsing it, that You've been going over it again and again and again. That, yeah, in your head you know that, that when Jesus gave his life on the cross, that he forgave that last failure. But you haven't taken it to your heart. This morning I want to invite you to do just that. Join with me in prayer. Jesus, personal faith, it's not lived on a resume. It's not lived in a trophy case. It's not lived in our accomplishments. And Lord, you know it's not lived in our failures either. The personal faith that's lived in you. And by the power of the risen Christ, Lord, give us power enough, grace enough to invite you to make your home in our hearts. That the life we live in this flesh, we might live in, in and through you, and we might press on, press on, knowing that we are people truly forgiven, not to practice, not to rehearse the pain, the betrayal, but to rehearse life, the power, the blessing grace that you live in us. Lord, may this day be that day that that life full, abundant, and eternal begins to live in us. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. Hi, thank you for joining us. My name's Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Our mission here at RUMC is to help people live a Christ-centered life. We're a welcoming church, we're a biblical church, and we're a compassionate church. That the, we believe that the way that, that God made us, that He made us in His image, and what the Bible tells us is that His image is an us, is an our. When God said in the creation story, let us create humans in our image. He made us to be in community together. He made us to connect to Him and one another. That's the place that this is at Roswell United Methodist Church, a place of community and faith. I want to invite you to join us. It might be online, it might be through social media, or it might be here in person. We meet at 9 o'clock in a contemporary service with a band. We also have two 1115 services. One is here in the sanctuary with a traditional choir and organ. We also meet at 1115 with a band in our chapel. 
Thank you for joining us, and I look forward to meeting you.